everyone. I'm David Ivory, and welcome to another edition of Montgomery County Community College's Masterclass Series. Uh, today we have a, a very amazing guest, and I'm going to actually introduce to you Brent Woods, our director of the Lively Arts Program. And Brent, you take it over, buddy. Thank you, David. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brent Woods. I'm Senior Director of Cultural Affairs at, uh, for the Lively Arts Series and the Fine Arts Galleries. <clears throat> Welcome to this uh, second of, uh, of the Masterclass Series this season. And today's guest is Stefan Harris. But before I pass this mic on to David, I would like to recognize uh, and thank some of our collaborating partners. Uh, the Sound Recording Technology Program, David Ivory, yeah. Michael yeah. Kelly, yeah. Howard Gordon, Jen Metlis, and uh, in helping to bring Stefan here to your class. Um, in addition, I would like to thank the Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation Jazz Touring Grant that helps us, and also our radio sponsor, the WRTI Temple University. And you, because uh, uh, our lively art supporters, and to you students who are our future engineers, musicians, and artists. So welcome, you guys. Here, yes. David. Um, today, um, educator, vibraphonist, and composer Stefan Harris has been heralded as one of the most important young artists in jazz by the Los Angeles Times. A four-time Grammy nominee, he is a seven-time Best Mallet player by the Jazz Journalists Association, recipient of the Lincoln Center Martin E. Siegel Award, Downbeat's Critics Poll winner for Vibraphone 2015 and 2013, and 2014 Expanded Critics Poll for Vibes from Jazz Times. He won a 2014 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Jazz Album for Wonder, the songs of Stevie Wonder, and is a member of the SF Jazz Collective. Harris earned a BM in classical percussion and an MM in jazz performance from Manhattan School of Music. Harris teaches at New York University and is an artistic director of jazz education at New Jersey Performing Arts Center. Harris currently teaches at the Brubeck Institute through their distance learning program and at, and at the Institute's Summer Jazz Colony. Stefan's landmark TED Talk, There Are No Mistakes on the Bandstand, was the most watched in its 2011 release and has over 500,000 views. I watched that and it was amazing, by the way. 2014, Stefan co-founded the Melodic Percussion Institute with business partner Cliff Swigett. Their first app, Harmony Cloud, was released on iTunes in January 2016. He tours worldwide with his band Sonic Creed, Blackout, and 90 Miles. In fact, Stefan has performed here in 2019 with Blackout and 90 Miles in 2011. Please give a warm Monco welcome to Stefan Harris. Right. Let's go throw this here. Thank you, everyone. How are you feeling today? All right, so we're going to kind of have an informal hang. I'm here as a resource. I'm happy to talk about harmony, life, love, anything that comes to mind. So let's, let's see what's on your minds today. Well, first I want to ask you just a couple quick questions to get this, the ball rolling here. Um, you come from a musical, do you come from a family of musicians or family who loves music? Like how did you, how did you get your love for music? Oh, that's a great question. I actually come from a community that okay. loves music. Okay. Right? It's it takes a than, village. That's right. It's bigger than just a, a, a family. My mother is a Pentecostal minister, mm -hmm. so I grew up in the black church. Mm -hmm. And some of my earliest memories are, of music have always been around the idea that someone stands up to tell a story, something from the bottom of their heart, and the music kicks in with the sole purpose of amplifying the emotion in that story. So the way that I was introduced to music was always from an emotional perspective and always from uh, a clear understanding of the value of music, its power to amplify emotion in others and help people connect together. Does that somehow play into the way you do your creative music, the way you, I noticed on the TED talk that you just kind of started, it was not <laughs> planned, it was just sort of like, you know, spontaneous from the emotion of the room. Do you mm -hmm. do that a lot? Is that part of that? Always. I mean, music ultimately is a reflection of your own ambitions. It's a reflection of your life experiences and, and what it is you're trying to get done in the world. My primary focus in life is about the proliferation of empathy through the arts. Nice. And empathy ultimately is not about right or wrong. It's about understanding. Right. And I, I 
am dedicated to empathy because I think it's at the heart of solving most of the problems that we have in our world right now, particularly around the idea that the world is getting smaller and smaller because of technology. It used to be hundreds of years ago, you could sort of hide out in your own corner of the world and didn't have to deal with each other. But now we're coming together and the task is going to be for us to listen and find beauty in one another so that we can create the innovation which will live in between divergent cultures. Yeah, so absolutely. the science of listening has always been critical to me and I love the art form of jazz. I love improvisation because it begins with listening, always. The first thing you have to do before you put an idea out is you have to understand the context in which you hope to contribute an idea. Right. So for me, as a musician, when we walk on stage, we're always open to the energy that's around us. And as an educator, lesson one <laughs> is always ear training. Right. Nice, very nice. When did you realize that you were gonna do this for the rest of your life? <laughs> wow, that's, that's tough. I mean, it's, I, I think we, as, as humans, I think we are who we are. Mm -hmm. I don't know that you change over time. I think you become increasingly more articulate. It becomes more clear. So many years ago, I wrote in one of my notebooks. I have these notebooks, hundreds of pages, where I'm just writing down a thought in the morning. How do I feel today? What's on my mind? And many years ago, I wrote down, I am not a musician. Okay. I, <laughs> okay. I happen to have I, a... I write that down every day. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so I wrote, I am not a musician. I happen to have a gift which manifests itself well in music. Now for me, that was a transformative moment because by writing that down, I essentially gave myself permission to dream off the bandstand. So did I always think as a child I would be playing music? Maybe, I don't know. But I think the general energy that I push through my music, I knew when I was a child. Wow. I knew that, I, that my, my, what brings me the most joy in life is connection is to inspire people, to bring people together. And as an educator, to see someone who's struggling, who's blocked, and then to go home and think through it and figure out what do I need to say to this person? I can feel, I can sense where they are, I can sense where they wanna go, and I'll work for a week, I'll do a bunch of research, I'll come back, and I'll try to say just the right thing to unlock potential in others. So I think I've always had that as a driving force in my life. That could have manifested itself in software, it manifests itself in the classroom, on the stage. So I think I, I always had a strong sense of who I was, but how it manifests itself is pliable. This is what I'm doing today. Maybe next year I won't play music. Who knows? All right. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah, it's, it's the moment is That's what right. it's all about. Um, uh, when you started working in jazz and started creating a band, what were some of the 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 way you kind of wanted to articulate your musicians around you like how did you how did you pick or did it just kind of fall into place like when you're performing like who do you pick the drummer the <laughs> keyboard player or like you know well is there certain certain things you look for you absolutely know? I, I look for people right. <laughs> and and I mean that sincerely right. like my my drummer Terry on gully is absolutely one of a kind Mm -hmm. And he's there because of his instincts, what he brings to the table. If I have a different drummer coming and sub, I don't expect the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm completely open. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I think back to the origins of the culture that gave birth to this art form, you're talking about a group of people who were marginalized, who were brought to this country and didn't have the opportunity to express the truth about who they were. If you showed your intelligence, you'd be killed. Mm -hmm. If you showed that you were in love with someone else or your aspirations, you'd be separated from that person, right? So the one time that this group of people could get together to sing the truth about who they were would have been in church mm -hmm. when you were left alone and you ended up standing up and the music was there as a platform for you to sing the truth. Now, if that was the one time during the week that you could sing the truth about who you were, you probably wouldn't copy someone else. You'd right. probably take advantage of that moment to let it all out. And then the congregation would sit around you and support that because everyone wants you to succeed. Then you would sit down and you would support the next person. So that's the culture that gave birth to this art form. So when I look to put together a band, I'm looking for people who, who have broken hearts, mm -hmm. who have not just broken hearts, but who have so much joy in them. I want authenticity. Mm -hmm. So I see a person who sees the world in a very specific way and my concept of the ensemble is wrapped around 
the people who make up that ensemble. So I remain pliable. I'm just one member in the ensemble. I bring what I bring, sure, right. everyone else brings what they bring, and the magic happens as a result. I noticed that in the TED performance that you did mm -hmm. and the couple other performances I watched, you, it seems like it's a good give and take and a movement. It, like it moves and it's not like, okay, here's the solo, <laughs> okay, here's that. It sort of like evolves yeah. what I saw. When you, uh, since we have a sound recording technology program here, obviously we, we do a lot of recording. What do you look for when you want to do a recording? Like, like do you prepare? Do you do pre-production? Do you just go in? Like, how do, how do you set up your, okay, you're going to come in and record. What, what's your preparation? <laughs> well, it's, it's, uh, it's ironic, right? It, it's that I'm, I'm extremely detail-oriented in everything that I do, but when I get on stage, I could care less. Right. Like, anything is possible. Okay. So before I go in the studio, I've, I've been thinking about every little detail. I've taken lots and lots of notes, but once I walk into the space, it just depends on what happens. So... For example, on the, our most recent album, uh, Sonic Creed, there was a moment when we were recording this piece uh, called Now by Bobby Hutcherson. I had worked out an arrangement and we were sort of getting started with it and Gene Baylor, who was singing on it, said, hey, I have an idea. I said, great. I said, Do you mind if I go up in the booth and try something? I said, sure. Everybody, everybody leave the studio except for me and Terry on and the engineer. She went up in the booth. She layered like 20 voices and created this whole chorus, but that was all on the spot. Right. I didn't know that was going to happen. I'm not sure that she knew that was going to happen. But we were again, just there. that same feel from like the congregation, like you're setting a view, she feels it, and you're like encouraging her to go ahead and p participate. And That's do that. right. There's another interesting moment from that album. It was late in the day. If you've done recording sessions, how you feel matters. It, it affects your ability to create. So this was one of the last days we were going to record uh, this arrangement that we were loosely working on of Abby Lincoln's Throw It Away. So we're in there and we tried one take and it just felt a little flat. And we were like, man, maybe we should just go home and come back tomorrow and see if, if we're fresh. Tarion says, nah, man, hold on, hold on. Turn off all the lights. Right. So they turn off all the lights in the studio. All, all you can see is the exit sign. I can't see the booth or anything. And we're like, well, what's going to happen? And Terry, I was like, well, I don't know. Who should start? We said, well, it doesn't matter. So we didn't care about the tempo. We didn't care about the bass line. Nothing. <laughs> we just turned off all the lights, and we stood still. And all of a sudden, our, our pianist, James Francis, he had been playing on an acoustic piano. But he had all these keyboards set up, but he hadn't been playing them. So it's, it's pitch black. And all of a sudden you hear, oh, like these, yeah. these crazy voices coming out of nowhere and it's pitch black. You don't know what key it's in. You don't know what's getting ready to happen. So we're standing there and all of a sudden this mood is set just by his choice of sound. And then I have to use my ear. I have to do lots of ear training. I have to be empathetic. And I challenge myself to jump in and I'm starting to connect with him. And all of a sudden I played one little line that indicated maybe this is the tempo. The bass player, the drummer knew exactly where to come in. We didn't count off. We didn't know if the melody was going to happen at all. And that just unfolded in one of the most beautiful, beautifully organic ways ever. So yeah. I love the balance. You come right. in with structure, but then you have to be willing to allow the music to be what it wants to be that day and be grateful for whatever the music delivers. Very nice. Very it's nice. a transcendent album. Oh, thank you. Thing. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about a little bit about harmony and about your composition. What, what do you look in, in when you do compositions? Uh, you're saying you start in different ways. Sometimes <laughs> it's this way, sometimes it's that way. Um, you know, can you show us or explain us to, to a little bit more detail? Yeah, composition is, is fascinating and it's incredibly annoying <laughs> because it's difficult. It takes forever sometimes. Uh, but when people ask me about my approach to composition, I have to honestly tell you, I don't have a single approach. Because if I had a single approach, all of my music would sound the same. same right? Right? Exactly. So for me, it's, I've taken many pathways. There are times where I've written out an entire story and then sort of mapped out what the, the shape of the music should be and then wrote music to that shape. Uh, one piece on the album uh, I wrote for my wife. I've been, it's going to be 20 years that I've been married. Yay! No, no, no. <laughs> 20 years in, in May. Uh, and being a musician, you tour a lot, sometimes you miss anniversaries, and I happened to be on the road during one of our major anniversaries, and uh, I was thinking about my wife, and I wrote a poem, and I hadn't really written poems before, 
And when I got home off the road, I went down in the basement immediately and put this poem on the piano. And I started to look for chords that articulated the emotion in each of the words. Yes. Right? So it was a completely different take. And let's see if this is on. I'll give you an example. Sure. <clears throat> Can we raise this a little bit? Yeah. Somehow. Let's see. Is that too high? No, no, it's perfect. My legs aren't swinging, so I'm good. <laughs> Can we turn this up a little bit? Oh, here we go. So the, the poem is really about making sure that we nurture the love that we have between us. It takes, uh, it takes effort, it takes time. Even when it's at its best, it still needs to be taken care of. So the opening line is, is let's take a trip to the sky. High and fly away. Right. Embrace that undiscovered place. We can if we just take a trip to the sky. So I immediately thought about, let's take a trip to the, I needed a, the sound of the sky, which would be kind of an open, whoop, let's see. It's kind of a really, let's take a trip to the sky. And then high is kind of a confusing, is there, a, does the sustain pedal work here? It's kind of going on and off. This is the sustain thing. Is it, is it the switch on the bottom? Is it of the pedal? opposite? Yeah. Yeah, maybe we can switch that, sorry. Let's see. There we go. <laughs> so let's take a trip to the sky. And then it's kind of high. Oh, I lost my sound. We're having trouble here. We improvise. Yeah, unfortunately you can, but with an electronic piano. And it's not about the pedal, right? We'll get there. <laughs> Try now. There we go. So we have let's take a trip. And then the next statement is, it's so warm, it's, and fly away. Right, so you have to think about what, what chord has that kind of warmth and embrace. And what I've done in my development <laughs> is I've actually taken every chord, basically in the American Songbook and Western Harmony, and I've written emotional descriptions for every sound. Mm. So if you ask me for fear, I can find it. If you ask me for haunting, if you ask me for heartbreak, I literally have hundreds of pages where I've categorized sounds. So this feeling of, oh my goodness, that's a minor 11 nine. I already know. <laughs> See, let's take a trip to the sky. And it's like, ah, you go, and fly away. Ooh, you know what I mean? Like, that's the feeling. So I'm looking at the lyrics, and I need that sort of soulful just. sense of wonder that's like a minor seven with a flat 13 so and fly away and I go, embrace check out this feeling embrace an undiscovered place which is kind of a mysterious statement anyone want to take a guess what's a mysterious sounding chord augmented yes augmented so if you, took a, if you took a D augmented and you put a B in the bass, what would that be? Mix some theory in there. Uh, D augmented, B in the bass? That'd be a yes. minor, minor major seven. Yes. So okay. you see that you understand the feeling. So I'm taking my knowledge of harmony, the emotional connection, and painting a picture. So I did, then fly away. like a passionate thing if we just take a trip so it has to be a chord that feels like this which is a sharp nine sharp five <laughs> and 
I need a soulful chord. One of my favorite chords is a sharp nine, flat five. Woo! I can't see. If we just take a trip to the sky. Then it says, let's take a trip in a dream. Let's take a trip in a dream. We can do whatever your heart So I'm painting a picture based on the emotion in the poem. That's one approach. I probably have, I, I can only think of one time that I've written a song that way. Hmm. There are times where I've written music where it was more technical. Like I thought of the, I, when I first started to do ear training many years ago, <laughs> just working on hearing intervals, I fell in love with the sound of a sixth. That's my favorite interval. I just love the sound of, or, and it's so beautiful, right? So I said, I'm going to write a piece of music that utilizes a sixth. That's it. So as a challenge to myself, I wrote this piece. This is, I, I'm not going to remember the whole thing. It's been a while. This is called A Touch of Grace. It's on our first Blackout album. But the melody is. That's six, and then it reverses it. Another six. Another six. All right? So the harmony I put under it is. Another song on the on the current record is one I wrote for my children. Uh, it's called Chase and Kindle. And that's one where I was thinking about family backyard parties that we used to have growing up and the feeling. We would have Donnie Hathaway and Stevie and Marvin Gaye. And it was the Temptations. It was always like a soulful, repeated bass line in the background that just made everybody move. So sometimes you write things and it's complicated harmony. But really, I'm trying to go after that feeling. So I spent a couple of days trying to come up with a bass line. Probably drove my wife crazy, but... And eventually I settled on this simple bass line. So there are times where I'm writing where the intention is to make you move your shoulders. There are times where I'm writing where the intention is to break your heart. Or there's time where I'm writing where I'm just, you know, I'm just trying to get off of my heart whatever I need. Right. So it's I never, never the same. That's amazing. Let's a little round of applause for that. It was amazing, right, everybody? <laughs> amazing. So, um, so when did the vibraphone come into your world? Was it first <laughs> or second? Chicken or egg? <laughs> uh... Well, you know, I, I was a kid who was obsessed with music at a very young age. It was never about an instrument. I actually taught myself to read music when I was about six or seven. Uh, my family moved into an apartment, and there was an old raggedy beat-up piano there. And in the bench of the, the chair were a bunch of books for kids. And I remember, you know, my brother, he could always go, that kind of, and he would never teach me. And I was always mad, right? So I would sneak out at night. I'm going to learn how to do this, right? <laughs> so uh, I remember taking those books, and I, and I can tell you, it's as clear as day to me. I remember opening it and looking at this, this, the picture of the keyboard, and it had a little arrow pointing to the white key that was at the bottom of two black keys, and it said it was a C. And I was like, hey, that must be a C. <laughs> and it was that simple for me. I literally looked at the pictures, and I started to figure out the names. And eventually, I learned like all my triads, but I learned through the mind of a six, seven year old. So for me, I could play in any key at that age because the way I thought of a triad wasn't like, well, if I ask someone, well, what's, what are the notes in an E triad? Someone might say it's the one, you gotta know your E major scale, and it's the first, the third, and the fifth note. But in the mind of a child, I hit a note, and I counted the ones in between, 
So there were three in between there and there were two there. So I was like, oh, major triad is just three, two. And then I went through and I realized that, oh, minor triad is just two, three. It's the opposite. So then I learned to play chords so that by the time I went to elementary school, I ended up playing piano for, well, that's probably, a, yeah, I guess so, maybe third grade or so. I played piano for the citywide chorus. And so by the time I started to take lessons, formal lessons in, in elementary school, I could already read, so I was a little more advanced than the other kids. So the teachers used to just give me more instruments to keep me busy. Right? <laughs> so I started with drums. I wanted to play trumpet like my big brother, but I, I had asthma and I, I couldn't cope with the trumpet. So I started with the, the snare drum and you know, I was more advanced. So they said, why don't you try a clarinet? I said, great. I took the clarinet home. I used to go home and play to cartoons. I put the cartoon on and try to figure it out. And then after that, it was uh, the string bass. I was a little guy, had to stand on a chair. <laughs> I used to be little, now I'm really tall. <laughs> so I played string bass. Um, then in middle school, I just kept adding instruments. So it got to the point where I played about 24 instruments by the time I graduated. In high school, I played sousaphone in the marching band because I was a wrestler, so I wanted to work out. Oh, nice. So I was like, give me the biggest instrument. I want to learn to play that one so I can get an extra workout before wrestling practice. Oh, nice. So my love of, of music transcends any, any particular instrument. I came across uh, the marimba in, in about seventh grade. Uh, I will say that in some ways, it feels like instruments choose you, right? They're just, I can tell you the first time I went up to that marimba and I kind of said, bloom, bloom, I was like, oh, that sounds good. It was much easier than trumpet. I was terrible at trumpet, horrible. I, any of those small mouthpieces, French horn, I was terrible. But I went up to this thing and I went, bloom, bloom, oh, that's pretty cool, and took the, took the cover off, and I said, oh, I know the notes of the scale, and you know, after a week or two, I could play all of my scales, and it just felt like a natural, natural connection. Yeah. And also, over time, as you can see, I, I can't stand still, <laughs> right? So for me to play the tuba or something, that wasn't gonna be the right fit for me. So right. one of the things I love about my instrument is that I think of performing as a science of communication, and your instrument is just one of the tools. Mm -hmm. People who've, People fall in love with you or they don't like you before you even reach your instrument. Mm -hmm. It's how you walk out on stage. It's how you greet other human beings. Mm -hmm. And then when you do play, everything that you do is part of the science of communication. So I like that I play an instrument where I can stand, where I can step back. I can show frustration. I can show, you know. Right, passion, the whole bit. Yeah, so I feel very connected to it. And I think I have pretty good hand-eye coordination for some reason, too. <laughs> so that helps. I think it would help a lot, yes, <laughs> no doubt. But I do love the instrument. It's a beautiful instrument. But if I didn't play that, it, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't lose sleep over it. I'd find another way to express myself. What are some of your, your musical heroes that, you know, that you, like, like helped inspire you to, you know, do what you're doing today? I mean, it's, the easiest answer is Stevie Wonder, right. like hands down. Right. Like that's my greatest inspiration in music. And it's because of the way that I think about music. Uh, the way I define music is as the science of organizing sound and silence into emotion. The, sound, the science of organizing sound and silence into emotion. And when I hear the music of Stevie Wonder, now, some of it is connected to my childhood and what was happening in the world when I, when I was coming up. Sure. But when I hear that, I can feel my own experiences. It's almost like he wrote the song for me. For you. you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. So his ability to organize sound in a way that people can feel is, is the ultimate goal. Now, I also love uh, different genres. Like I love Beethoven, too. Beethoven 7 is one of the most beautiful pieces of music ever written and I remember I, I started playing classical music actually I didn't play jazz until I got to college oh, I see. and actually I wasn't even good enough to get into college for jazz I had a full scholarship for classical music that's all I had been working on mm -hmm. um, so I remember being in in, uh, in about ninth grade or so and there were there was a time where the conductor of, my, of the youth orchestra I was in the, I think it was A.G. Uwe, who was in Boston at the time, so he'd be driving to Albany from Boston, and he was late for some reason, and they were like, hey, Stefan, you want to conduct the orchestra until he arrives? And I got up there, man, and I just yeah. fell in love with it, and I just remember obsessing about Beethoven 7, like every day in the mirror, like learning to conduct it and pull all that emotion out of it. So I, I just feel connected to organized sound. I mean, the beauty of music and art in general is that it's universal. 
right? It's everyone on the planet knows love. Everybody knows fear. Everyone knows compassion. Everyone knows jealousy, no matter where you are on the planet. Right. And those are, those are the emotions that we're ultimately trying to articulate. So I'm able to find that in a variety of spaces. Although the platform that I choose to utilize when expressing myself is going to be more directly to more directly related to my cultural experiences, but I still can connect with other cultures and learn from them. Awesome. I'd like to, if anyone has any questions while we're going through this, if anyone has any questions while we're going through this, please don't hesitate. To, uh, Howie, go ahead. Um, first of all, thank you for coming down. It's amazing. And we have a pretty good mix, actually, in this room. Sorry? We have a good mix in this room of students that are involved in the music program, in the, in the jazz ensembles, and the SRT programs. Um, and there's always this you know, this boundary that's blurred between what's music and what's production. Um, so for the students here in the SRT program who are not, you know, familiar with jazz and don't know the ins and outs and the nature of that animal, what are some of the things that they should know in terms of if they get a call to do uh, a recording session for some jazz artists? You know, because most of what they do is very, you know, mm -hmm. it's four bars of this and it's four bars of that and we're going to loop that, you know, instead of the, the whole... <laughs> open-ended nature of things? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I have a few thoughts on that one. <laughs> uh, the big thing to remember if you're working with a group of jazz musicians is that it's not predictable. That's the thing. They may come in with a certain plan, and if something, sometimes something goes wrong, <laughs> a mistake happens, and it turns out to be amazing. So you always have to remember that what jazz musicians are doing is, is focusing on what's being delivered by the music in the moment. Right, we, we are, uh, I fancy jazz musicians and most great artists as empaths. They're great empaths. They're aware and highly perceptive. So if you're in a studio with a group of jazz musicians, you gotta know that any plan that you came in with, you gotta remain flexible. And you can't bully a, a jazz musician one way or the other. Some engineers are like, no, this is the way the bass should sound. And the, someone else may come in, a musician say, I don't like the way the bass is sounding. And it may be completely different than, way, than the way you imagine it. And it's worth investing the energy to take a few unknown steps to see if you can get the sound to the space that that artist is looking for because it may ultimately work out perfectly. You know, there are times where an artist is unfocused and doesn't know, um, so it's, it's a gentle balance. So I think the openness of the art form is really critical. And if you're an engineer and you're a producer, uh, understanding what is the value, this is one of the things that's hard to learn when you first start recording, you know, you have people go in and they do 50 takes of something, right, over and over again. And basically, you're going to get different versions of the same thing. You're not going to get better from take to take. So really what you're looking for is not the perfection, especially with all the technology. We can edit just about anything, right? What you're looking for is which take had the most momentum, had the most energy. I mean, the magic. had the magic, yeah. right? Not necessarily, well, you missed this note, and we, you know, the tempo wasn't as fast as we want. It's like, really, did it come together? And then you go, I love working with engineers. I, I have no issue with editing. <laughs> I'm like, let's go, let's paint this picture. That's part of the, the process of creating art. So it's pretty well, open. Also, never hit stop until it's really over. Yeah, right? that's for sure. Because <laughs> that happens a lot, and you might think it's like a it's a it's a section that's just done and it's over, and all of a sudden somebody starts playing again, and you already hit stop. And yep, that's, that's very important. You know, another bit of advice I would give to engineers, if you know, you have to be managers too, right? You're dealing with different types of artists who have different personalities, and it could be frustrating. One thing that a lot of artists may not understand is that engineers develop that ear muscle in a way that we don't. There's a, you, you're going through hours and hours of listening to music at a certain volume and a certain in intensity, whereas we're not used to doing that. So if, you, if you're mixing and you're working on something and the musician is in the room with you the whole time, most likely their ears are going to get tired before yours and they're going to start asking for things that might not even make sense. Right. What I like to do is I like to work with people that I trust. Not only the musicians but the engineers. So I'm like, we record, okay cool, I'm going to step out for a little bit, I got some other work to do. How much time do you need to get to the point where you want me to hear? An hour and a half? Cool, I'll be back in an hour and a half. I come back, my ears are fresh right. and then we can work from there. But a lot of times you have, you got to deal with people who are in the room with you and sometimes they're, not every musician uh, has trouble with this, but sometimes there's someone there who can really hear and they'll want to stay. But I tend to want to work in general as an educator, as an administrator, as a business person. My, one of my highest values is trust, so 
You hire people who are really good at what they do. You empower them to do what they do. You step aside, you come back, and then you try to bring it all together. Good. Question? Uh, hi, can I call you? Stefan? Absolutely. <laughs> um, That's what my mother calls me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Stefan, I have a uh, question about the process of composition. I know you kind of touched on it already, but I just want to know as I guess I would call myself an aspiring composer, more so than maybe a performer. I want to know if there's anything particularly challenging about the process of composition, and also how do you go about writing music for instruments that you don't play? And I don't play that many instruments, I just play two. Mm -hmm. So I know this might be, <laughs> you know, a harder question for you since you kind of play every instrument. <laughs> Well, I played at. <laughs> I don't know if I'm very good at all those instruments. But it has helped me over the years to understand, before I studied anything about the clarinet, I remembered that it sounded different in three different registers. It's like three instruments. Like down here, it's nice and warm. And then right up here in this area, I don't know the terms anymore, but it's kind of thin. And then you get up high, and it has that piercing sound. So almost every record I write, I use clarinet because it's one of the most versatile instruments. So I can take a clarinet and blend it with a trombone and it's amazing, right? But then it'll also work perfectly with the flutes up high and then it trim, it, it, it's a beautiful uh, texture to add in the middle if you're writing in this register, this sort of, what's this called? I don't remember. Yeah, These top, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so that's, that's been useful for me. But the big thing is, even though I've, I've studied, I'm just a child in the world of music, and I don't follow a lot of rules, right? So it's really about imagining. The first time that I switched a trombone in a tenor sax wasn't because someone told me to, it's because, well, I don't like the way it's vibrating. You know what I mean? Like, if I had, if I had this, some of it's like common sense. If I had uh, uh, two trombones and a tenor, you would say, some people would say, well, the trombones are lower, so you put the trombone here, the trombone here, and a tenor here. But then I'm getting this from my trombone. Is that the emotion that I want? Maybe. So I started to think, no, that's not the feeling that I want. So I started to say, well, what if I put the, the two trombones here, one here and one here. Now I'm getting this. That's the primary sound. And then I put the tenor. We tell the tenor to play a little softer on that. So I get this. This is a very different emotion than this. So I'm starting to think about the balance, right? There are great pieces of literature out there where you could study this. Uh, I've read a bunch of books, but for the most part, I'm, I'm a child and I just break rules. I ask questions. If it doesn't sound good, I try something else, right? So I don't know that you have to understand every instrument. I think you have to have, uh, you have to listen deeply though. Like, what are you going to get from an accordion? What are you going to get from a triangle, <laughs> right? They all create completely different sonic pictures and there's nothing wrong with using any of them. Right? So be, be courageous in the process. The other thing that helps, though, is, is understanding register. But you can, you know, Google it. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's this, great, there's this great thing that I had to pay attention to in designing the algorithms for my app, actually, is the, uh, what do you call it, intervallic limits. Like, the lower you get, the, like, if you take an interval like a half step, it's, or let's take a different one. Let's say you take an interval, uh, I don't know, like a third. That's beautiful there, right? If I take it down an octave, it's still okay. If I go down another octave, it's starting to That's get so muddy, right? So there are certain intervals, like it's like the lowest place you should probably play that major third is around A flat C. See, it, feel, it still feels open, but if I go down here, it's a totally different emotion. But that's like, I Googled it, I don't know. <laughs> and I pay attention to, to things like that. And also over time. It's your ear as well, training your ear. Yeah, and over time it changes, right? I mean, I, I've written for, some, for viola and cello, and, and I, mean, I may continue to do that. I might not ever do it again. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Speaking of all these instruments, and especially since we hauled that thing up here today, I was wondering <laughs> if you could do something on the vibraphone and give us a little ex explanation of something that you may do on that or um, you know, um, some, maybe some ideas of composition that would be completely different from the vibraphone to the piano, or maybe it isn't. I don't know. What do you... Yeah, I don't know if there's a difference. Um, I tend to not use the vibraphone that much. I, I almost never write on the vibraphone. Maybe early on, okay. I wrote a piece called Feline Blues, which was supposed to be like a cat running across the keyboard. So I did some crazy kind of twisting things on the vibraphone. Uh, 
but one of the one of the things that uh, I one of the ways that I think about composition is that you don't create it actually. Right? It's almost like creativity is this overrated word. It became this sexy thing. I mean, I'm going to be so different and creative. But the reality is we're not creating anything. Usually you're discovering something. right? Great artists are visionaries. And vision is the proper term because it's about what you can see, not what you create. People who are geniuses, they live amongst us. There's probably some geniuses in this room right now. And we all walk down the same campus. But where I see a tree, they may see a dragon. right? And I'm like, I don't see the dragon. I don't know what you're talking about. Hopefully, what they'll do is work on the craft of being able to utilize an elucidating dye to pour on that dragon so the rest of us can see it, right? So it's really about perception. It's not that I'm creating the dragon. Say, no, I can see it. So I spend most of my time as a composer, as a teacher, just focused on listening and developing my ability to be really, really perceptive. So for example, even as I'm talking to you right now, like I hear that sound, I heard that little click over there, it just happened again, like I can hear, I'm aware of everything that's happening around me, even as I'm communicating. So the vibraphone is a useful tool for me to explore the feeling of every note. So if I, if I were to take a drone, I would tell you that every single note here has a different feeling. Do you mind doing this for me? Can sure, you just sure. pedal some octave C's? So I would tell you that Do has a very specific feeling, and it feels very confident and grounded. It feels like this, Do. But then Ra is kind of Ra, right? Re, and then Mi, Fa, Sol, my favorite note, Le. Like every single thing that I'm singing has a different emotion. So when I go to the vibraphone, when I'm playing, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to play the emotion of the note itself. So I just keep pedaling for a second. So I'm playing. Soul is gonna be a big full note. And then there's the heartbreak, the heartbreak of T. V feels like this, it's kind of spooky. So when I improvise, I'm actually just playing the feeling of the note. Watch this. La is the most joyful note of all, the A. <laughs> Check it out. Whether it's, I mean, improvisation is basically really, really fast composition. Awesome. So, <laughs> so, so you teach a lot. Um, I hear that you're a, um, uh, a uh, you, you endorse community colleges. Uh, I do. <laughs> give us a little talk about that. So I'm, I'm currently the uh, associate dean and director of the jazz arts department at Manhattan School of Music, um, which is a fantastic institution. It's one of the best conservatories in the world. Um, so my passion for music education is strong. Uh, as I said earlier, my, my ultimate drive in life is, to, is about the proliferation of empathy through the arts. So working in the field of education is one of the best platforms uh, in which to do that. Uh, however, uh, as I look at the challenges that we face as a nation as it pertains to the cost of higher education, outside of music, any field, any field. I'm concerned that we're essentially bankrupting the next generation of great artists because of the cost, and it's troubling yes, to me. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Yeah, and it's not, it's not just the institution that I'm a part of right now. It's, it's all of those institutions. I mean, Juilliard, Manhattan, the New School, they all cost about 50000 a year tuition, right? right? When you add room and board in there, you, you know, food and food, yeah, you're, you're paying over $200,000 for your degree, and that's a crippling number. So I believe that art is essential to our development. One of the reasons that art is important is because we're, we're essentially storytellers. We're griots, that's what we do. We go out and we tell the stories of our communities. We paint pictures. 
particularly of marginalized communities. The reason we do this is so that as a species, we gain a deeper understanding of the small parts that make us whole, right? If you don't have artists, many times you just have the controlling class that sort of pushes its message forward. And even that class will never be whole without understanding everyone that's involved. So many times the first touch point for one culture to learn about another is through its art. And it's also because 500 years from now, I think civilizations of the future are going to look back at us and how we spent our time on the planet as artists, as cooks, as drivers, whatever it is that we're doing. Not because we're so amazing. They're going to look back because they're going to want to learn something about themselves. They're going to want to understand the journey that the species has undergone in order to arrive at their current state of existence. So it's our responsibility to tell the truth about the world that we've inhabited, that we've inherited, so that we can learn from one another, so that we can grow. So I see that as an incredibly significant value for future civilizations, for opening up doors, for finding connections between all of us right now. So because of that, uh, I'm going to continue to support arts education, but I don't I want to make sure that I'm trying to do, I'm supporting it in a way that doesn't bankrupt people. So as I look at the landscape, it makes perfect sense to me that community colleges, state schools, they should be the future of right. arts education right. because there's direct alignment with the mission of a community college and exactly. the mission of art in our society. It's not just about making money. And it's way more inclusive as well, That's especially right. financially. That's right. Yeah. So I see, I think the bubble's going to burst with many uh, conservatories. In fact, there used to be a hundred standalone conservatories in the United States. There's about seven now. Right. So there's a change that's going to come, and I'm a fan, and I'm absolutely rooting for inclusion. And another reason that I think uh, this idea of inclusion is going to be important is because of technology. It's because of the advent of artificial intelligence. Like the reality, is it's here now, mm -hmm. right? It's creeping along. Self-driving cars, that's five, that's five years. Trucks, I think, the, I think Andrew Yang was saying it's something like in 22 states, yep. that's the number one job. Five years, that's it. Mm -hmm. Self-driving trucks are going to be here. No one's going to dig a hole. Artificial intelligence is real. I, I'm going to anticipate that down the line, we're going to have a few primary problems, one of which is going to be muscle atrophy. <laughs> right. right? Like, no doing what are you doing? You're not leaving the house, right? But then there's this spiritual problem that where we all want, it's in our nature to want to come together. It's in our nature to want to express ourselves, to communicate, to give. I think fields that have the ability to bring people together are going to thrive in future economies. And I also think the idea that you're going to come and watch a masterful artist, a masterful musician do something is, a, is something that occurs during times of luxury, right? Everything's yeah. cool, we're, we got food, everything, everybody's happy, cool, let's go out and watch such and such do this thing. But when you don't have that, I think there's a need in all of us to express ourselves where we're going to want to get out and do it ourselves. So I'm rooting for the idea that you should have community orchestras. You should have community jazz bands. Like, you should have high-level artists, but that doesn't put them ahead of the Anyone right of else. everyone to participate. Exactly. So I think what's happening at community colleges, I'm rooting for them. I hope that it continues to grow. I more than hope, but I, I'm happy to contribute in whatever way I can to the well, success. You're certainly contributing right now, so I <laughs> thank you for that for sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, any more questions for Stefan? I'm sorry, go ahead. So I play cello. Problem for me. If you want me to repeat the question, yes, yeah. please. All right, so I play cello and bass guitar, and I feel like the big problem with me is going between classical and jazz, or going from jazz to rock, or switching genres and switching that mentality. How did you juggle that at a young age, and how do you juggle <laughs> that now as a composer more than a performer? Wow, that's a tough question. Yeah, well, I would tell you honestly, uh, I don't juggle. Like at this point, I am who I am. Right? I create what I create. There are elements where you would hear some of my music and you'd say, oh, that, that kind of sounds like classical music. And then there's stuff where you would say, oh, that sounds kind of like R&B. Then there's stuff where you like is straight ahead jazz, right? Soul music. So it, it's become a part of who I am and I give what I can authentically. Now, when I was coming up, uh, I did play a lot of classical music and I think what helped me was just to give everything that I could to the music, to really be open spiritually, emotionally, to to be becoming one with what was happening around me, to give my best. 
And then as I moved to other genres down the line, I did the same thing. But in the long run, there were little bits of classical music that stayed with me. There were little bits of R&B music that stayed with me. So I think at this point, it's about honesty and authenticity. But while you're doing it, give everything that you possibly can to it. In the long run, uh, I don't think what the world is looking for is a, is a, a cadre of master craftspeople. Right? When you look at European classical music, you look at orchestras, you look at the foundation of conservatories. Conservatories were built in order to populate orchestras. Right? But there are very few orchestras in the world right now. So I think the world is not looking for master craftspeople. The, the world is looking for artists to paint compelling stories and tell the truth about the world that we inhabit. So for you, it may be that you need to use the cello to paint that picture, but maybe this finger isn't going to go where it's supposed to go because you're looking for a different sound. It's okay, break the rule. When you're in your lesson, <laughs> listen, learn as much as you can, but when it's time to express yourself and create, there are no rules. All these rules are designed to be broken, including the rules that I teach. I have a whole fully integrated college curriculum. That I, but when I start teaching, I always tell my students, understand, everything I'm about to tell you is designed to be forgotten. <laughs> I'm, only, I'm just helping you get past the block. But once you get past the block, you don't need any of this. I wish, man, trust me, if I had the choice between understanding theory and all that and just being able to hear, I'd rather just be able to hear and create incredible music. But I'm glad that I understand theory. Sure. <laughs> but, you know. But it's a lot of work either way. Oh, absolutely. There's no, there are no shortcuts. There's no shortcuts to anything but work. That's for sure. That's right. That's right. You right. know, I read a great book, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, years ago. Right. And one of the takeaways of that book uh, is at one point the father tells his son, like, well, look, if you're, if you're using discipline and you're willing yourself to work on this, then you're doing the wrong thing. Right, because you, you should love what you're doing. Like, I, right now, there's no place I'd rather be than right here with you. I don't want to be on stage right now. <laughs> I want to be right here in this moment. I absolutely love it. And, it's, so, and then when I am working on something, I'll get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, like, let's go. I'm ready. I don't need coffee or anything. I got to get to this. I got to solve this problem. I knew this chord. It's supposed to go here, but it doesn't work. I don't know why. I got to go down and figure it out. It's not about discipline. And then there are times where I go through phases of practice uh, where it's, it's almost meditative for me. Like I practice with drones a lot. I, I almost never practice in silence. Even if I'm working on something physical, there's always a chord. There's always, if I practice six hours, that's going ah for six hours. And then I'm working on top of that. And it becomes meditative for me. So I can go and go and go, but I'm like, I'm breathing. It's like I love every moment of it. Those moments where I'm like really willing and pushing myself to do it, I tend to walk away from those, you know. And it, this is like, again, it's, it's sometimes you have a deadline you have to deal with, so there's a balance, obviously. <laughs> but even when I, I have to deal with a deadline, I tend to start early enough to give myself that creative flexibility to walk in and out of the situation. We have another question over here. Um, turn on. There you are. Oh, it's on. Good. Um, business model. Who's your audience, and is your audience to monetize your work or to become more exposed? And number two, what's your philosophy on mastering? And uh, if you, you eventually have to master somehow, mm -hmm. is it for your Lexus car stereo? Is it for <laughs> your home system, or is it for the beasts or the Sams? Well, it's for my children. Right, so money matters for me. Right, I mean, I'm I'm a uh, I'm a first generation to go to college in my family. My grandfather was a sharecropper, so I'm trying to get my family to the next level. So money matters. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dance around that one. <laughs> it's not my primary motivation. Which is, your, is your business toward the internet uh, streaming sales, CD exposure, all of them? So. So there are different avenues because I have multiple businesses that are under my umbrella. What I would tell you is the primary way that I interact with the world is that I'm looking to be authentic first. I'm looking to create. I'm looking to understand what it is that I can see, that I'm looking to pour dye on it so that I can help others see it. And then I'm going to look around the world and I'm going to say, where is that valued? Who's interested in that? Who's intrigued by that? And then I will take it there in order to monetize it. From a, from a financial standpoint. 
Uh, the bigger picture ultimately is about empathy. I'm hoping that we inspire all types of people. Ha more than half of what I do is in corporate America, actually. I, I give leadership training talks using art, right? So it's not even always about being on stage giving concerts. I do that because I love it, and it's actually turned, I've, real I've come to realize it's an important emotional outlet for me. Uh, but then my app company has a totally different audience that we're going after. We're, we're focused on creating tools that unlock people's ability to understand one another. So we're going to focus more in the educational market, right? So it, it just depends. Depends. But it is important to think about it, and I have lots of graphs and, <laughs> you know, strategic plans of how I want to make these things work. Even solving the, the issues associated with the cost of higher education, I understand who my audience is, and I'm, I'm drawing up plans right now to solve those challenges. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Well, listen, I want to thank you so much for being here today and sharing your time thank with you. us. I truly appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Everybody, Stefan Harris. All right. Come on out Saturday. We'll have a good time. <laughs> and he'll be there Saturday at the uh, theater, right, Brent? Yep, 8 p.m. 8 p.m. So uh, there's the man over there in charge of any of the ticket and access, if you'd like. Um, so, again, thank you, Stefan. I appreciate it very much. And this ends our master class series here at Montgomery County Community College. <laughs>